We have a one-size-fits-all approach to zoning where you can take an acre and you can build eight townhomes or you can build eight houses. And so a majority of people said that that doesn't make sense, that yes, we should, um, we should have minimum lot sizes that correspond to those building types. And so I think this is a question that really supports uh, the approach that's being taken in this uh, draft zoning code that we've prepared. Um, I also think, going back to the previous slide about what are the least effective ways to encourage affordable housing, I think the visual preference survey that we did is really indicative of what people actually care about versus what they perceive is important when it comes to uh, a city zoning code. And so, you know, I, the pictures that were in this, I will admit, are small, and so it wasn't meant to be something where you could really study every, every feature of a house. It was really meant to say, you know, what do you see in this picture and, and do you like it or not like it? So um, we had 19 photos on the website and we picked the, the four favorite examples of housing and the four least favorite examples of housing and I think the, the results are very interesting. Um, on the favorite examples of housing types, uh, number one was a townhome project on Bainbridge Island which has four townhomes uh, with uh, 1,700 square feet per unit. Uh, this, this is actually a slightly higher density than, uh, or um, lower density than what we will allow in our code, but this type of project would be allowed under the proposed zoning code. And so this currently is not allowed in our code because you would have to have a 5,445 square foot lot per townhome and nobody would build a project at that density. Um, the second most favorite house, and I think this is really interesting because this is actually a low income housing project in West Seattle. This is a house that is small. It's um, an 1,800 square foot lot, three bedrooms, one and a half baths, a 1,200 square and 40 square foot house. So a very small house, much more in line with what was being built in the 40s and 50s than what is being built today. And interestingly, this house doesn't have any garage. It just has a, a front loading driveway with one parking stall on the side of the house uh, that you can pull into. And I, it may actually have enough room for two cars. It was hard to judge from the photos. Um, but it's, it's interesting because it's a very small lot. It does have a one lane front load driveway. Um, and yet people in their responses about how can you encourage affordable housing um, said we don't want smaller lot sizes. So, so that was one contradiction that was illustrated. Uh, the third favorite project was a mixed use project in Burien that some of us saw on the field trip that we took. And this is um, a project that was built 124 uh, units on, and it comes out to about 82 units per acre. Our current zoning, uh, until we had adopted the mixed use pilot program, the most that we allowed in our zoning code until very recently was 20 units per acre. And so this is four times the density of what could have been built in Port Orchard, and yet people selected that as um, one of their top projects. It also has um, lower parking uh, quantities than what would be required, although that isn't evident by the photo. And so I don't think you can make the jump to say that, oh yeah, we need a lower parking requirements, but, but visually this, this project has less parking and um, was feasible because of the parking standard that was in place. Finally, um, picture 19 was another house in the same development as picture six, but this was a market rate unit with an alley load garage. And again, it was a very small lot, 3,400 square feet, um, one car alley load garage, and it was a three bedroom, two and a half bath house. This would be allowed under the new zoning code because the new zoning code allows for down to 3,000 square foot lots if you use an alley load garage. So um, I think the, the important takeaway from this is in the pictures of what people like, and this is supported, I think this supports our, um, our design standards. Um, the um, number one, all of these projects have extensive landscaping. And the landscaping I think does a lot to mitigate the impact of smaller lot sizes. And all of them de-emphasize the garage, which is, which is already a code requirement, um, though we're, we're kind of restructuring how that code requirement works in the new zoning code by having uh, maximum driveway widths relative to, to small lot sizes so that you don't end up with a situation where you have a big two-car garage on a narrow lot, because I think that's what people generally don't like. Um, moving on to the, the examples of housing types that people didn't like, um, a lot of these examples, the interesting thing is seven is actually the back of the house on number 19. And so that was, that was looking at an alley load garage and I don't think people knew what they were looking at. Um, but 
but clearly if you thought that was the front of the house, you probably thought it was pretty ugly. Um, the other houses, one of them is a very small uh, house with a two-car garage, front-load garage in the Puyallup South Hill area. Um, and, you know, it is on a small lot, but this is an example of a, a small lot house that doesn't work. Um, house number nine, my previous employer uh, out in Eatonville, this was a, a modest four-bedroom uh, detached house, but it's on an 8,400-square-foot lot. But it's totally devoid of, of any amount of landscaping, although you can see in the picture that they have some trees that they might be looking uh, to be ready to plant. Um, but I, I think the fact that there's no landscaping, uh, there, there's not a whole lot of architectural variety or detail. The, there is roofline modulation, but not a change in materials. Uh, and it's just, it's a pretty basic structure and it's a two-story structure. And I think that maybe people have a preference. There's a certain segment that has a preference for one-story houses over two-story uh, as well. Uh, so any, in any event, I think this picture sort of illustrates that that it's what the house looks like. It's not the lot size that's <coughs> important, and it's, it, the landscaping plays a big role in things. Um, house number 10 was another house from this West Seattle development at High Point that included two of the, the favorite examples, but this is a three-story model. And so I think maybe when people see three stories, they say, oh, we don't want a house that's that, that tall. And so perhaps that's a consideration uh, uh, in our as we develop the code it's also a small lot at 2700 square feet and so um, maybe small lots uh, shouldn't have that kind of height and that's that's a consideration that we would take into account so I think um, you know I, I posed a couple of questions at the end of this uh, sort of interpretation of these uh, zoning co or zoning surveys results and really it's just to ask you whether you think that we're on the right track that the uh, to think about whether the feedback that we've received through this survey supports the work that we've been doing up to this point, um, and whether you, you know, you agree that the design standards and landscaping requirements as a central feature of our future zoning code should take a front seat to some of the other considerations like smaller lot sizes, and, and to see what other thoughts you might have about this, and so perhaps you want to take a few minutes to discuss these results or ask questions. I wonder if people didn't understand about the small lot size versus a picture. You know, I, because they seem to like this small house. Mm -hmm. Well, I think that was intentional. And, and in terms of how we set this up is we didn't, we didn't want you to focus on the lot size when you were making your decision about whether you liked or didn't like something. We wanted you to look at the picture and the aesthetic and sort of make that determination of is this good or is this is this bad in your opinion? And I think if we would have had people focus on that, they would have said, oh, that's a small lot, or that's, you know, that's too small, and made that decision not based on what they're seeing, but based on their perception. But I thought one of the questions was, do you want small lot sizes or something like that? And, there, it, and the answer was no. Yeah, exactly. The and question. So that, that's all I'm saying is I wonder if they, they don't know what a small lot, or what you can put on a small lot. Yes, because I agree. Because when you look at the picture, it looks good. I agree. I, I think that people, when developers cram a bunch of two-story houses with two-car front-loading garages into a development and they're six feet apart with no yard, yeah. people have say, that's terrible and we don't like that. And so it's not that they don't like the small lot. It's they, they don't like the huge home with a front-load garage on a small lot. Right. With no landscaping. Yeah, with, no, with bad landscaping. Or I'm surprised they like number 15. I sort of am too, actually. But it, I will say it looks great. In, I mean, it looks really good in the photograph. It, I mean, when we this is the one we saw in person, right? right. Yeah, we walked around this building. Yeah. Each side was sort of very different, if I remember correctly. So I look at that, though, and I think that would look good, like in Bremerton or something with a bigger footprint. Mm -hmm. But I don't think our town, it was kind of like when they built this. It was like, wow, look at that monster. Like, it didn't fit in. And it yeah. still kind of is that way. And I'm wondering if that would well, look out of place. I think when one is going to look odd, mm -hmm. but I think if you have more than one and it's around the town, mm -hmm. like they've talked about, I think it, it will ease into seeming normal. Does yeah, that and make I, sense? I would point out that the blocks in Bremerton are much, are uh, Bainbridge Island, no, Burien. The, this block in Burien is much larger than what <laughs> blocks we have. Huge. And so the scale of, of this building on that block is wouldn't be possible here because our lots are 120 feet deep 
in the old part of town. Um, so I don't think you could you could see a building this tall, but it wouldn't it would be maybe wide and shallow or you know um, deep and narrow, but it, you're not going to get the big square. And it did have a lot of landscaping around it. Each side of this building is very different, and they incorporated landscaping that built literally onto the building using grades. And they had some really smart design aspects, I thought, to it. It wasn't my favorite one on the tour, but there was parts of it I thought were really strong. But I think the ones that everyone liked too, if you notice, they all have a lot of greenery that's really positive and it looks lovely landscaping. <clears throat> The only thing about that is um, it looks good here. And they have gardeners, probably, or they have someone to take care of it. But eventually, a lot of it's going to look like that. Well, on a lot of the back side of this in West Seattle looked like that, actually. <laughs> I mean, it, some of the houses were really kept up well. Some uh -huh. of the blocks were a lot nicer, I think, than some of the others. But that's going to happen anywhere. Oh, I, mean, I, I understand that. I'm yeah. just. But some of it did look sad on the other yeah. side. They had like a feel, a uh, play area that looked like it hadn't been watered in a long time. And listening I mean, to this conversation, I think one of the drawbacks to the way the survey was put together is these are pictures of individual houses, not of a area of street or a neighborhood. Mm -hmm. right. So you kind of get a single picture of one mm -hmm. structure and not how it fits into the entire right. zone. That's a and good so if you put one of these almost, you know, one of these favorites someplace in Fort Orchard, it's, it's going to look out of place because we don't have things that look quite like that unless you put it into certain parts of mm -hmm. the town. Because each area's got its own little bit of character. So you almost have to look at it like a, you know, four or five houses in a row mm -hmm. to get the true feel of it. Plus that we also get but an average of how well different people take care of it yeah, and what it sure. does over a long period of time. Agreed. And with the whole um, thing in here that they were looking at with um, the maps of everything on how the development is, a lot of this would be for that. So that would have some flow to it, I think would be nice. I was actually really impressed with, um, with all that they did here, with what you guys did in this. It was pretty impressive, I, I thought. You did a really great job and, um, on the layout and explaining of everything. And I love the diagrams because I'm very visual. So that was great for me. And I, um, I also enjoyed um, in the back, I love the um, examples you have for um, the rain gardens. Mm -hmm. I love On the that. landscape code? Yeah. Yeah, I thought that was brilliant. Well, we'll talk about the landscape cha chapter as we go through our agenda here because we haven't actually reviewed that in full. I liked it, to so see. <laughs> okay, so if there's no further questions on the presentation, um, we can move on in our agenda if uh, <coughs> everyone's ready. Okay. Are we done with the discussion on that? So we'll move on to B, the recap of the previously reviewed zoning code chapters. Yes, yeah, so um, tonight we have, are you reading the, which agenda are you on the, the most uh, recent? I got public hearing zoning. Item B should be public hearing zoning code update draft chapters. This is different. Well, that's because oh. I paid more for that. Oh, hers is different. It's because this is the one she sent us. She sent an email out. Oh, I didn't. I didn't do that one. So. Oh, um, yeah, it is. Sorry, I'm looking this, at the wrong one. This word. is the correct one, right? This is the correct. One. Oh, I'm on the wrong one. Never I'm mind. On the wrong one too. <laughs> Everybody should have so, a copy of the revised one. Mm -hmm. So, um, as we all know, we've been reviewing these draft chapters and we've been bringing to the, them to the Planning Commission in batches, trying to introduce you to how the code is to be structured, um, what the land use tables, the building type chapter, and the individual zones look like, and there, there is still more zoning code to come. And so this is kind of a recap of what we've reviewed so far and sort of what things look like as they're being assembled together. And, and this is not necessarily the final formatting of the document, but we're we're getting close on text. I think there's probably still a few typos that we will catch as we do start doing a, a more um, cover-to-cover review of the document. 
Um, but up to this point, we have um, gone through chapters 20.30, the introduction, 20.31, zoning maps, 20.32, building types, 20.33, the green belt districts, 20.34, the residential districts, 2035, the commercial and mixed use districts, 20.36, the industrial districts, 20.37, the civic and open space districts, 20.38, overlay districts, and then 20.39, which is the use provisions and use table. And then tonight, um, we're going to be introducing the landscape code and significant tree code because I don't believe that we got all the way through that at our last meeting uh, before the end of the agenda. And so, um, that's actually item D on the on the uh, agendas. But but really the purpose of tonight was to kind of present the entire packet as far as how far we've come on this, see if there's any public testimony and check in with the public, and then get back to the work of reviewing these draft chapters and land tonight is landscaping and significant trees. And then in September we will bring you the next batch of codes, uh, which will ultimately be followed by a public hearing. So with that said, I, I don't have a whole lot more to present on what we've talked about already, but if you have questions, feel free to ask, and otherwise we can move on to the public hearing. Any questions? Mm. Good. Good. Okay, so we'll move on to C, the public hearing, the zoning code update draft chapters. Do you want me to open it, or do you want to say Yeah, just something? open it, and okay. we have testimony. At this time, I'll open up the public hearing. Okay. And, and before we uh, before we move on, I did want to note that I've been making the rounds and giving presentations on what we're doing at various community groups. I've met with a group of realtors today. I've been to the Home Builders Association. I've been to uh, the Rotary. The uh, I don't know. I think it's, I've gone to like six or seven luncheons in the last three weeks, and I'm, I'm probably forgetting. Oh, the Chamber of Commerce. So we've we've really been making the rounds and telling the public what we're doing, where they can find out information, inviting them to take the survey. Um, so I'm actually a little surprised there's not more people here tonight, but hopefully they liked the presentation and they liked what they heard and that's why they didn't uh, care to show up. So um, with that said, if there's no testimony, we can move on. Okay, so at this time I'm gonna close the public hearing for zoning code update draft. For the zoning code update draft. So we'll move on to D, the discussion of the draft zoning code chapters landscaping Chapter 20.128 and significant, significant Trees, <laughs> Chapter 20.129. All right. So um, the Landscaping and Significant Tree chapters were written with um, help from our consultant who also worked on the design standards for us, which we adopted earlier this year. The, um, the overarching goal here, our, our existing landscape code was very cumbersome and difficult to administer. It, it didn't have uniform standards for when you needed to prepare a landscape plan. Um, it didn't, you know, typically a landscape chapter is doing two things. One of the main objectives of the landscape plan is to create buffers between uses and a landscape buffer is a way to mitigate transitions from single family neighborhoods to commercial or, or other transitions between between uses and building types. And so a big part of this chapter talks about the different types of landscape buffers and how wide those buffers are when you have those transitions within the city. Then the other portion of this is general landscaping of your site. So when you go to actually develop your site, what are the requirements for a landscaping plan, for irrigation, for the maintenance of that landscaping, and for generally keeping your site looking attractive and so that isn't necessarily that's more of an aesthetic consideration than it is a uh, a buffering or mitigating uh, consideration uh, as it relates to to separating uses so um, I think you know I've shared this with the development community and nobody so far has said that this seems out of line with what is expected of them but I do think it's a whole lot easier to read um, it also does a much better job with incorporating LID, uh, rain gardens, and other environmentally, environmental stormwater type features into your landscaping, and specifically allowing uh, those stormwater features to be located within your buffers or your required landscape areas. Can I ask a question? Definitely. Um, is, is all of this verbiage, is it new, or? This is totally new. The old okay. landscape code is in, in the garbage heap. So, okay. 
Because sometimes it would be nice to have something to compare it to. So like to put the new over the old or... It would just be one one document deleted and one document. I mean, there's no there's no way to compare them line by line because they're structured entirely different. If you do want a copy of what we have in the landscaping code, I can co copy and email that to you if you want that. Well, I just think it's it's difficult to know. I mean. It, this is probably great. I'm not saying that it isn't, but it would be nice to know what we are changing from, what we're going to, you know, because when you explain it, then we, you know, I don't know. It's just, I, I work with policies and procedures all the time, and we just, like, strike them out and put in the new verbiage, and then we kind of know the old from the new. And so it's fine. Well, can you guys give us a couple ideas on some of the major changes between the old code and yeah, this new proposed code? Definitely. So um, first of all, I would, so page 13 of the landscape code is the, uh, talks about the buffering between uses. And I think this is, you know, this is really the meat of, of what it is that we are implementing through this. I, I think Requiring a landscape plan and, and installing landscaping on your property is a pretty standard practice as part of our existing landscape code. But this is really saying that when you have when you have different uses and you're in and it looks at which zone you're in, um, what how wide your buffer has to be and which type of buffer it is. Right now, we don't have buffer types in our code. So this is so type. Uh, a, B, and C are the, the three buffer types, and so on page 12 it talks about, um, well, let's see here, actually page uh, 8 and 9 talks about these different landscaping buffer types, and so the, um, I'm sorry, 6, 7, 8, and 9 talk about the, the buffer types, and so type A is a full screen buffer, and so that means that you have to plant tall trees, things that you can't see through, and so it is a visual buffer, and that's your most intense buffer where you would be separating industrial uses from residential uses or other, other things where you want to hide something that's potentially an ugly use or that has noise or that has dust or, you know, um, is generally uh, somewhat of a, you know, an annoyance. Um, type B landscaping is a filtered screen. So it's, it's partially site obscuring, um, but it's, it's not as intense in terms of the frequency of plantings. And so maybe between single family and multifamily, you don't need a full screen because for security reasons, you want to be able to see people coming and going. You don't want people hiding out behind the landscaping. Um, and so it's appropriate in, in other zones. Um, the type C is a, a fully see-through type buffering. And so uh, it has different ratios of plants and, and plant heights. Um, and then type D is, is kind of all the other, this is your general, um, landscaping, which can be um, lawns, trees, shrubs, any, really anything. It's kind of a free form. And then a low hedge uh, is the fifth type that is, um, is allowed in certain situations, as well as a rain garden, which is another thing that can go in a buffer where you need to deal with your stormwater. And the best place to do it is in your required landscape strip. So then when you go back to the table on page 12 and 13, you, you know, if you're proposing a development and you're uh, the developing use, if you're building a moderate intensity non-residential use, which is, you know, maybe a townhome project, it, depending on what you're abutting, if you're abutting the mixed use zones, you only need a five foot type B or C uh, buffer, or you can put in a path. But if you're abutting a single family residential zone or a, an R3 or a or R3, R4, or R5, um, it's a 10 foot, a, B, or C. We don't really care about the type because the purpose is, is just to create some nice attractive separation between the uses. Um, but then when you get over to the industrial heavy, um, when you have a use featuring an open storage yard, for instance, you're going to have type A or B required, which are more about hiding uh, an ugly thing. Uh, and, you know, heavy industrial uses actually have up to a 20 foot uh, buffer. So. It's, it's really about scaling the buffer to the type of use in the zone in which you're in. Um, so that, that is definitely new. Um, we also have 
parking lot landscape standards and we've number one we've tried to make these a little bit more flexible because right now our code says you must have a tree every 12 stalls or eight stalls i forget what the frequency is and it's really hard to design a parking lot and meet rigid parking requirements when you have to take up a parking stall with landscaping every so many stalls we really wanted to talk about how much overall landscaping needs to be distributed in your parking lot and so it's more of a, a square footage to parking stall count rather than a every eight stalls you must have landscaping and that way we give people flexibility if they're running out of space or if they if they have a an area that's left over that they want to provide landscaping we still get that landscaping and that vegetation without um, you know hamstringing the development or making something really difficult so it's it's made to be a little bit more flexible um, the um, foundation plantings when you have foundations that stick up a few feet above the ground and it's kind of an ugly concrete finish we require uh, plantings along foundations that's not something that's currently required by our code um, and then the bonding and uh, maintenance provisions have all been revamped because what we have now is not very effective and in fact the bonding provisions are totally contradictory because they don't distinguish between maintenance bonds and performance bonds and so sometimes a development will occur where you have uh, somebody is finishing their project and it's fall and they don't want to go put in a bunch of landscaping right before winter when it's going to die so they want to put up a, perfor a performance bond that says that we're providing this bond we're going to come back in the spring and plant this and once we plant it we want to convert this to a maintenance bond which is a two-year bond to ensure that the plants don't die and that we water them and, and let them establish themselves right now we require a 125 percent bond for the performance and maintenance which are typically two separate types of bonds and um, 125 percent for maintenance is a huge cost maintenance is usually you know 20 or 50 percent uh, for landscaping and so um, we have we have separated those two uh, types of bonds and and the performance is actually 150 percent which is what we require for public works projects because it costs the government more to do everything because of prevailing wage laws if we actually had to go in and finish landscaping because a developer fails to do what they said they were going to do it's going to cost us a lot of money to administer that so that's that is a significant difference any other thoughts carrie I like the table format of this that runs right along with the zone tables. This makes it easy for anybody to yeah. pick it up and understand it a little better. So is the type of fencing addressed at all? If there are fences, I didn't see anywhere where that. We have fence standards already in our design guidelines, at least for the, I think, do the fence apply to single family or in single duplex? family um, and duplex. Okay, so we have fence standards when it's a single family or duplex type type development. Um, I don't know if the design standards address those or not. I can look it up. For commercial. Especially like around the retention ponds. Mm -hmm. Like when there's a commercial development with a large retention pond and then there's just a chain link fence put up around it. I feel like we addressed that in the design standards. Yeah, we were, we talked about that because you talked about possibly leaving the fences off and, if and addressing it here, right? Did we talk about that? I think we did. I think yeah. we did. Yeah, I'm I'm pretty I'm almost positive that we incorporated that because that was requested as part of the design standards review. Yes. One of the other things that's in our existing landscape code that really it's also in our public work standards is we deal with street trees both in our landscape code and in our public work standards and they contradict one another and so the the street tree requirements need to be in our our road section drawings that are in the public work standards um, and because those are actually in the right-of-way and not on property that is zoned they don't really belong in the zoning code it's a it's a street construction standard um, I think the other, um, another big difference here is that the, for applicability, um, our existing landscape code does not, um, let's see. So, 
so our, our existing code says that requirements for a landscaping for a subdivision, short subdivision binding site plan or conditional use permit shall be determined during the application review process. So it doesn't actually say that this is required. It says that the director is going to determine sort of arbitrarily what's required for what project as part of a review, which does not give a developer any certainty or any uh, clear guidance as to what the city expects of them. The new code is very specific to where you can open this and say this is what I'm required to do per code and there's no ambiguity. Um, and it's not that the city can't impose a more strict requirement under SEPA, under our environmental review, if we determine that a particular use, maybe an industrial use, is going to have a huge impact and we want them to actually build a berm around the use to help mitigate those impacts as well as wider landscaping. Um, but this is kind of a minimum standard and it's black and white and it's, it's very clear to a developer what is expected. And it's also clear to the residents uh, you know, if you own a single family house and you're adjacent to commercial property, you know because it's in the code what the code requires that developer to provide in the way of buffering. <clears throat> Is there more questions or comments on that? No, I like it. Do you guys have any questions or? Let's move on to item E of the Planning Commission retreat. So nothing, nothing. nothing on the fences. Yeah. Right? Yeah, oh, we didn't do significant trees yet. I thought, oh, sorry. So Carrie, did you, did you find nothing on the, on the fences that In the design still standards, open? we addressed blank walls, but we did not specifically address fencing in terms of design requirements. We did previously, the previous year, adopt standards for residential and for single family and duplex residential fences. Hmm. Somehow we talked about fencing. I remember having this conversation. Yeah, yeah. And I remember talking about it too, especially um, the issue of fencing stormwater ponds, which is uh -huh. a, a safety issue as well as a design issue. I do remember that discussion. Because we talked about Gig Harbor doesn't do it, mm -hmm. but we do it. And so we talked about maybe we could relax that. Yeah, I remember, I only remember it specifically around the water retention ponds. I don't yeah. remember it being any other aesthetic. Yeah, yeah. So we talked about, we were talking about maybe incorporating it into the, when we address landscaping with this document. Yeah, I thought, when we talk about the, in the design guidelines, the usable residential open space, we talked about how ponds could be counted as open space if they're designed with sl gentle slopes that are actually usable mm -hmm. rather than being the, the fenced type of pond. And so I think, I think our discussion really focused around providing the required amount of open space as part of your development and whether you could count the stormwater pond as open space. And by having a fence, you could not count it as open space. Mm -hmm. But it, it didn't specifically pre prevent you from doing that because the fence is, a, you know, is really a safety uh, feature for a pond that has steep banks. Right, we talked about that, and, and so th you wouldn't be able to include that as, as part of your open space if it did have the fence around it. But yeah. we, we started to address the aesthetics of having like a chain link fence or, or the type of fencing to go around like one of those big retention ponds that mm -hmm. we. So there's a picture in the design standards of the Walmart pond. And it says the above image shows a stormwater pond that would not qualify as a shared open space. The pond is fenced, inaccessible to users of the development, designed by steep rocky banks. And so we, we put that in there as saying, we didn't specifically regulate the fence, we really regulated the, the pond as counting as open space. And moving forward though, is it gonna be allowed to put a pond like that again in the front? I mean, that almost looks worse than a garage. Um, well, it, per the design standards, the building has to come, remember we have the build to zone and the commercial zone? Even if it's like commercial up there? I mean, yeah, yeah. commercial up there is different than commercial down here. So you, you know, have, space we're wise. requiring buildings to be brought out to the street as part of this zoning code. Even up, yeah, everywhere. up by Walmart? And, yep. Okay. So, so, you know, Walmart is typically the anchor and then you have smaller retail spaces. And so in this case, and I think one city that does this particularly well um, that you know, I don't think it's a great example of urban design, but I think they do a good job of mitigating the visual impacts as Lacey. If you're in the Marvin and Martin Road area near Olympia, um, all of their shopping centers have 
retail spaces that line the street that buffer the parking lot and the stormwater is never out by the street because they're required to bring that retail space all the way out but those are the those are the junior tenants with the anchors sort of back behind them so i think in the bethel example we would have made them put the stormwater pond off to the side or have retail along the entire frontage okay so we didn't really we don't really have a conclusion as of to what we had in, desired right yeah and we i want I, the we want, want it to be an, a instead of a retention pond with a fence we would rather it be a, an open space that's usable well yeah because so there's an incentive built into the existing code to make that a usable open space because you get to count it as your stormwater and your open space you could choose to provide additional open space in addition to your fenced pond um, but we really I, I don't know that we want to go so far as to prohibit chain link fences because they're effective they're low maintenance and I don't think everybody you know the cost of building a cedar fence around a stormwater pond would be you know tens of thousands of dollars um, and is, is going to be is going to be worn out and looking dilapidated in a number of years if it's not maintained so I don't think we, I think we're incentivizing them already to try to make their pond open and inviting rather than a, an ugly feature. Okay. And but it won't be in the front. Yeah. Anymore. Yeah, it would be. Right. So if, they were, if we were to like replace Walmart now, it would actually kind of be reversed, right? Is that how we're envisioning this? Well, they have some retail in that parking right. lot, but they probably would have identified additional retail pads and maybe the building would be a little bit narrower and the stormwater pond would be along the back side, you know, between an access point for mm -hmm. trucks delivering things and the edge of the property um, but yeah I think they would have changed had to change the shape of the building a little bit and brought more retail out to the street to meet the the build to zone requirement okay does a stormwater pond have to be round like that or can it run like narrow and long like on the like it, the, the depth of the property? there's so many design considerations that go into it and a lot of it is going to be hydraulic uh, okay. I mean soils and infiltration and where where do you have the best soils for putting the pond uh -huh. so I don't want to dictate shapes of ponds or, or anything. No, I didn't want to do that either yeah. I just was curious so if they always mm -hmm. have to be round like that no they don't have to be and and really the the codes now say that you need to do rain gardens as a first choice and it's only if they're infeasible can you do uh, a traditional stormwater pond like that so the the stormwater codes require a low impact development it's just that we have terrible soil in port orchard and most sites don't support that it's kind of a combination of most sites not supporting that and having a, most local engineers not being huge proponents of low impact development to begin with and so they're not quick to advocate for that mm -hmm. um so so in a large in a housing development even a smaller housing development if a retention pond is determined to be necessary, will they, is the location of that also regulated now a little more? Because those are up right on the street too. That, that really comes out of the subdivision process. And if that street is designated, you know, we have in the design guidelines, the landscape streets, the storefront streets. So arterials, you may not be able to bring a pond like that out to the street, but I think on most residential lots, um, where there isn't that type of designation, you potentially would be able to build that pond there, but the stormwater code really discourages that because it prefers low impact development okay. as a first choice. And picking up on one of the other threads in this conversation is the fencing. <clears throat> yeah. Where are we going to put the discussed fencing? Is that gonna be in this landscaping or is it gonna be somewhere else? Well, I think we already have a fence chapter and maybe we need to amend it for commercial, but you know, I think, um, I'm, I'm hesitant to restrict fencing because number one in industrial areas you know I don't think fencing is probably an issue at all because you want security and it's probably chain link and you know barbed wire or razor wire um, in residential zones um, it's regulated uh, in single-family and, and um, duplex areas for multifamily um, you know I think the design standards that we have I mean people are building nice buildings I I don't really see people putting in really cheap or unattractive fences as part of a multi-million dollar multifamily project. So I don't, I think that we're asking ourselves if we should solve a problem maybe that doesn't exist. Also for buffers, for fences that are meant to be part of a visual buffer. Yeah. yeah. You might want to have some. 
but but a chain link fence isn't going to be a visual buffer. No, that's no. What you're saying. yeah. But so a cedar fence would be a cedar fence would be because it's side obscuring. So it's going to have to be a solid type fence. But is that that there. is that addressed in any of these buffers on the landscaping? Um. Yeah, I, I suppose in the. There's no common offenses in the landscaping. Yeah, we we, we could look at landscaping. It indicating that <clears throat> a, a fence in a type A situation must be a solid fence, um, and a fence in a type B situ situation could be a picket fence or something along those lines. Um, that might make sense to include. I don't know if you want to go so far. You know, one thing some people like to do is use like a vinyl chain link, a vinyl coated chain link fence with slats, and they'll use black or green slats to kind of hide things. Which the nice thing about it is they're very low maintenance, and they can be pressure washed, and they're never going to uh, deteriorate. And There's so, some, a new one by Dick Bliss. He put it up behind his new double lot. Which we, yeah, um, yeah, yeah, it's. It's a tough situation. I think St. Vincent de Paul is a, an example where they built a project on a very tight budget. Um, we, they were required to do a fence, and we allowed them to do the vinyl. I think it's <coughs> vinyl coated chain link with slats. And part of the reason was, I mean, I think that they were going to financially have a difficult time maintaining anything other than a very low not maintenance. Not that cheap. Fence. Dick Bliss was four grand, and it's not huge. Yeah. And I did a cedar one on the other side that's not huge, and mine was forty-four hundred. So, I mean, it's not that much cheaper. I mean, cedar's a little more expensive, but I had a little small section of that. I mean, the other part would be longevity and maintenance. Yeah. Maintenance. Yeah. Because maintenance cedar fences issue. can look pretty run down. We've already had to spray ours eight months but in. But then again, chain link fence, especially the ones with the visibility slats in them, mm -hmm. can look bad very quickly as well. So, um, there's maintenance. Not that I want to add it. this anywhere. I just want to know. That fence up here was an issue to some people, how it's backwards. backwards. Yeah. Is that written somewhere that you have to put a fence a certain way? That's in the single family Did that just get put in there? Okay. Uh, yeah. yeah. And think of it this way. They're letting the burglars climb in, and they have no way to get out when they do it reverse. Think about it. The slats are on the outside, so they can just climb right in, but they have no way to get out. Once so then in. you've got them. You've caught them. Sort of. Yeah. <laughs> That's why. And then your dog whoever does that, that is not very it. smart own homeowner. I mean, it's just <laughs> not brilliant any way around. So if you think about that, right? Right. See if you put it's boards easy. on both sides and they can't try get it in. Tonight. Or out. Yeah. <laughs> I already tried. Oh, it, it, it's true. No. <laughs> So we want to move on to significant trees. So I think we touched on this previously, but the the big reason for the change in the significant tree ordinance, I think first and foremost, is that currently our significant tree ordinance only applies to new development. If you just want to go cut down all your significant trees and not develop your property, nothing says you can't do that. And so this ordinance basically says that no, you have to retain, it doesn't matter when you want to cut them down. If you have significant trees, they have to be replaced at this ratio, whether it's part of development or, or not. Um, and the other thing that we've done is, is previously the ratios were, well, first of all, they weren't clear when you have to do required landscaping. It didn't clearly state that your required trees either counted towards your replacement trees or whether they were in addition to your replacement trees. And so when we started thinking about this, there's a, a site up on Sedgwick that's entirely forested right now that there there's an application for development in. And they have something like 40 significant trees. If they replaced 40 trees on that site, it would be more forested than it is now. Um, and there wouldn't be any room for development. But they do have to do landscaping buffers around the perimeter. And so they're planting trees every, I think, 15 feet on center or, or something. And so we wanted to make sure that Yes, you are allowed to develop a site that's forested. The intent of this ordinance isn't to stop you from developing something. And really, we wanted to value bigger significant trees more than little significant trees. And so if you're a 36-inch <laughs> diameter tree, the ratio is higher than if you're an 18-inch significant tree. And so I think that's what this ordinance does. And it also closes a pretty big loophole that lets people 
cut down big big old trees anytime they want as long as they're not developing. So like on Mile Hill where the new Taco Bell is right next to it, it was all cut down and it's just like a, a, a hot mess. Well, that's the county. I, I have no idea. Well, that's on that. county. Yeah. Sorry about that. But um, yeah, in any event, I mean, we do the best we can with what we have, but it's uh, it's definitely a tightrope when you're dealing with a developer trying to tell them that hey we have an ordinance that intends for you to keep these trees and not advertising that if you just want to go cut them down before you apply for development that's perfectly fine so that's that's kind of the, the situation that we're in right now you have a, that's a tough one. you had a um, incentive kind of a purchase incentive and in some we talked earlier where if they wanted to build a higher density here they could offset somewhere else uh-huh is there room to do something like that with the trees? Well, that's actually in here. Your replacement trees can be replaced on site or off site within a certain proximity or in a public park with the permission of the public works director. So, so we do um, allow those uh, to be off site. So I think there's situations where if you have a small site and there's, you know, a bunch of significant trees, there's no place to replant trees, or your house is going to be covered in branches and leaves you know most of the year so that's like you said that had 40 significant trees they could replace some of them on site but a number of those could be then put in a yeah yeah and, and part of this is if you have one or two significant trees and you're developing we still want to create an incentive for you to try to retain those as part of your future development and so you have to make the cost of cutting down the tree high enough that somebody would have an incentive not to do it but you have to be also be realistic about you know not making a site undevelopable because it happens to have a bunch of big old trees on it. So that's um, that's kind of the state of the the code um, in terms of where we're at right now. Um, at our September meeting, we'll be introducing new materials, and uh, depending on what that packet looks like as we get closer to the date we may have a, another hearing in September to talk about this or we may wait for October and I think the other um, issue that we needed to talk about was um, do we want to talk about the September meeting date yeah we should because it's right after Labor Day and I had sent out a question to everybody just saying hey would it make sense to move that meeting um, and I think I, I heard from a couple of people on that and you're, you're gone the second the second week of September I'm at a conference um, most of the week so, um, so it would be probably later in the week um, any of like the Thursday the 6th uh, yeah the 6th would be okay for me or maybe the 17th which is a Monday or um, maybe the 20th You know, we could do it towards the end of September, but then we're right on top of our yeah. October meeting. So would any of those dates work? The 6th, the, uh, actually the 6th, the 10th, the 17th, or the 20th? Six, the I could do the 10th or the 17th. I can do any of them. Yeah, I'm not good on Mondays. <clears throat> so the 10th and the 17th are tough for me. What was the other date? The 6th? Yeah, Thursday. 6th or the 20th? I could do the 6th, too. 6th. I mean, there's no reason we have to move it. It's just that the Tuesday the 4th is immediately after the holiday. I mean, was there a... I mean, that's a, a business day for us, so we don't have to change the date. So really, it's, on, it's only if you want to change. Works the best. I'm yeah. fine on the 4th. I'm good on the 4th. You okay. Fine for the 4th. Oh, yeah. Okay. Leave it as is to the fourth. Yeah. To the fourth. All right, we will meet on the fourth then. Okay. Okay, and then you want to talk about the retreat? So the long promised retreat, uh, which Annette reminded us of uh, at the last meeting. So we were trying to get some ideas of what might be good topics for a retreat and what type of format would be most useful. And I had sent out just, you know, an email asking people for some ideas in advance. I heard from one person, but it was kind of more questions than, than answers. So I guess I'm coming back to you guys with, if, if we have a retreat, 
what are, what are the kinds of information that you think would be most helpful for you to understand what you do and how to do your job and could you know, make you feel more um, prepared for what you're being asked to do each month? Are we looking at something that would be kind of during the daytime, you know, something that would take several hours of a working day? Are we looking at a weekend type retreat or what, what would be most so feasible? Are you, are you guys coming too? Yes. I, well, I assume we would be. Because the one that we had before, it was just us, which is fine. I don't care if you're coming on. I just didn't know what we were. But when was your last retreat? I, I don't know. Were either of us it here? It was like 10 years ago. Oh, it gosh. Was a long time okay. Ago. And we met at, um, actually, we met at Rob's house, is when he was on here. Okay. And we just kind of just kind of talked about what we, you know, about the city and where we thought it was going and kind of our ideas and just. And it's, if nobody wants to do it, that's that's fine. But I know that when we did that, it was you know it was it was yeah, pretty it's interesting. Yeah, it was it's a good idea. kind of informal. Kind of got to know each other and. Mm -hmm. What would the actual? What's the goal behind the exactly. retreat? Is it one for us, kind of a team building and getting a meeting of the minds and getting to know each other's thought processes better, or is it for us to become more educated and? theory behind or both. design yeah, it could or be both, both. Or, it's, it's, I mean so what yeah. for doing this and I have no problems with doing I think it's probably a good idea but I would like to know what we're trying to accomplish by putting in six eight ten hours at a I hope it wouldn't be ten hours <laughs> <laughs> but I think that's kind of what we're, we're trying to find out from you is what are like the <laughs> gaps in you know either as you say you know team experience or you know a knowledge of the subject or a knowledge of the processes anything that we can help you with that would you would benefit from a more intensive discussion than we can have in our regular planning commission meetings i think that one thing that is is different from when i started years ago is that we used to do the what the hearing examiner does so we knew more about what was going on in the city so we so when we come now we have this packet and, and we work on the updates and that but we don't really know what's going on within the city, like where the growth is, or because we're not we're we aren't like you guys that work with it every single day. And I I think it's just me anyway, knowing the old way versus now. I just feel a little out of touch with. I can agree with that. So what's, what's going on? We did the field trip yeah. though, right? Uh, a couple of months ago, was that? Well, that yeah. and that was interesting, but you know we've done. And not that we have to do that again, but. Um, well, and I, I guess there's two field trips. Didn't we do a, we did a driving tour of the city to look at projects and the field trip to Seattle, but I think only Mark right. and Annette, but you like, went, yeah. I didn't go. Or I no, Sue Ann, yeah. We were, but like going to Seattle, that's, that's great to get like ideas, but what's really happening here? You know, you guys know of, of bu potential builders that want to come in and do different projects and um, so are you looking for kind of a big picture, like yes. development trends, you know, yeah. here's where building is going and here are the projects we're reviewing, here's the pre-apps that have come in for this type of development? Just kind of, yeah, be more involved with it. So then when we look at stuff like this, it makes then we sense. have, yeah, it, it makes more sense to us. Mm -hmm. The context. Yes. So and, and it's like, well, if he over here is looking to do this, well, then maybe we should look at this different or better or or it's fine the way that it is, so we can help promote. Yeah, I, I think one of, uh, one of the risks for us is that we can talk about pr ongoing city projects and development projects that have already been permitted, mm -hmm. but it's, it's somewhat risky for us to actively talk about something that's working its way through the process because we don't wanna say anything on the record that would right. indicate a bias one way or another against a particular project. And I so, get that. I, I, and that's fine. It's I just would. the people that have gone out for permits or, you know, even the local homeowners that are going out like for a permit to put in maybe one of those new little houses or something like that. Then we could like drive by <coughs> and take a look what's going on and just to see. I would put together a couple things. One is I like the idea of kind of doing a field trip within our own town and community and not necessarily projects that are necessarily coming up but you could actually help us look at problem areas mm -hmm. and see how what we're doing is going to hopefully mitigate that in future um, I also think that actually even walking us through the process walk us over your building 
the other day when we had the um, extra meeting in July, that was the first time I ever been in your building. Um, I think it was an eye opener when we looked up at the files and saw everybody's got their own property file in there. Um, but to see the process of if you're a homeowner or a contractor walking in your front door, the forms, the process, what it goes half goes on, I would find that very interesting to see. Because mm -hmm. we're making those people go through those hoops. So I'd like to see what the hoops they're having to do, yeah. how your department's laid out, how it works. Meet some of the other folks that are working for you. We see you too. You're the, you're the face of the department. I assume there's other mm -hmm. planner twos, planner threes, et cetera. Um, and the field trip, I think a luncheon where we can sit down, somebody's house, wherever, I don't care, someplace quiet where we can talk and have this conversation, start to get to know each other and our own perceptions of our community and dreams for our communities, our community, where we can then sit and talk about, say, yeah, you know, I like what they're doing over here. This looks like direct. <laughs> I think we need to throw city council in there too in regards that I feel a disconnect I kind of said mm -hmm. that to you because we go over all this stuff for sometimes for months at a time and I feel like when it goes to them they're like yay or nay and it's done and it's in and out and I, and I feel irritated with that a little bit be not at you guys just in general because I feel like we do all the homework and we do you know all the all of this and then when it goes to them they just make the final decision and I feel like there's a disconnect is it very often that they change make much in the way of a change I don't know. We don't. I, I presume don't. that it's. Yeah, do you know? I mean, it's. Yeah. see your point because our job is to vet all these issues so that they can make better informed decisions. But at the same time, too, I mean, we. Um, when they do change it, I don't feel like we. I mean, they get the right to do that, and I understand oh, that's their position. But it, sometimes I don't understand why they make those decisions. And there have been times because they have the right to, and I get that. Like the yeah. flags. I'm like just when you sit in the them. meeting, sometimes they're like, "Well, what did the planning commission say?" And usually, you know, like Nick will be like, "Well, we got two of them sitting over here," or he'll just, to, you know, give them kind of a synopsis of what it was we talked about and why we made the decision we did. Sure. But maybe but that's because that, I'm not educated where. enough, and maybe I need to, as a planning commissioner, go to city council meetings, which I do not do. How, how many of you have uh, have been through the short course on planning? I mean online or in person I, I mean I know we did one a few years ago here but all the online stuff before I came to my person? first meeting huh. okay. I got little certificates even yeah there we may want to send you information about some additional outside training as well just to <laughs> kind of you know it's it's kind of like government 101 for planning commissioners to to better understand the legal framework in which you're working and in which we're all working but um, you know, I, I, we did put money in the budget also for training opportunities, and so there are, I don't know where the state APA conference is this year for Spokane? Oh, Spok Spokane's a long haul. Um, but maybe the, you know, maybe there'll be a training opportunity that some of you would be interested in going to and uh, for a day or two, and, you know, we can make that part of this as well. But I, I think an annual field trip to go out and look at projects, which I don't remember, was it last fall that we did it that? It was, yeah. So, Maybe um, once we get through the zoning code here, we'll if we have some time uh, on one of our regularly scheduled dates, we can do another field trip. I think a field trip outside of the city, maybe not all the way to Seattle, but um, you know maybe we can go to Tacoma or, or go look at uh, a project somewhere else would be a good exercise. I think some additional training, and you know we periodically have had retreats, our joint planning commission council kind of study session meetings where we talked about specific issues, but. Um, you know, maybe next year the, uh, for a portion of the, the annual council retreat, there should be a discussion with the planning commission that you maybe come for an hour or two to talk high level visioning things before they get into more budgetary type stuff. Um, so I think, I think, you know, I think you're, you have a, a right to, to want to have that level of communication. I think it makes sense. And part of what cities in Washington are going through is that the planning enabling legislation from 50 years ago set up this role for the planning commissions and then the growth management act in the 90s really changed that as did most cities going to hearing examiners because of the risk of of appeals of decisions and sort of taking away the the permitting authority from which a lot of planning commissions used to handle and most of them no longer handle your role is really just this comprehensive plan which is very formulaic under growth management act and 
takes, you know, it, it's greatly reduced the role of the Planning Commission compared to what it was historically. So, um, yeah, I, I think it's, uh, it's important that we maintain that level of communication because it used to be forced and now it, it doesn't exist in the same way that it did previously. just start with just us meeting you know even if it's just an hour or two or whatever have breakfast yeah something yeah. if everybody's up for that yeah let me yeah. just see where we want to go from there for sure yeah. okay okay does that does that turn into an official meeting or anything or? it does yeah it, we have to advertise it so um I, do you do you want to pick a time and maybe we we do a meeting at dcd and bring coffee and donuts or something and yeah. can talk. Maybe we can go through some recent permit history and kind of show you the permit process for for various permit types. Can yeah, we, a, do we have to like, can we like go outside of the walls though? Could we go somewhere else? Like, do we have to do it within this building or that building? No. Can the, it be more casual somewhere? It can, but the only limitation is because if you have a quorum, it does have to be noticed. The public has to be allowed to be there. So but they don't have to have any, you know, input into the meeting, but they have to be allowed to sit and watch if they want to. I doubt they'll come, though. <laughs> I know, but if you have it in Maybe your house you or something, <laughs> that could be kind of awkward. Yeah. Well, can, does it have to be recorded? Because I know some of the... Yes, it, it does. Yeah. Well, actually, that might be an education for us to begin with, is, is mm -hmm. open meeting mm -hmm. rules. Yeah, if you, if you have a quorum, it, it constitutes a public meeting, and it has to be recorded. Right. And there's certain things you can't talk about to each other about within certain parameters. So I don't know if you've ever had that. When I was yeah. on Department of Health um, board, that was one of those things I made sure the board heard every year from the attorneys. Mm -hmm. I don't think we necessarily have anything that we're not allowed to talk about in our case. It's been a while since I went to the attorney last. But. Well, not discussing it in an open public meeting like yeah. this, but you know, Three of us end up meeting up over at Denny's for coffee, and all of a sudden we're starting to talk about yeah. um, planning committee issues. Mm -hmm. That can't. There right. are certain rules against doing yeah, that. Yeah, we, we wouldn't be able to do that specifically, right? Right. Well, <clears throat> unless we have, if we'd have less than a quorum. Correct. You could do that. And our quorum is five. Quorum five. is five. Who wants out? <laughs> <laughs> Who's getting voted out the island here? I'm sure. <laughs> I like the idea of you know just having a, a an hour long breakfast and just kind of like throwing some ideas out there and then I think probably from there we could probably figure out where we kind of set an agenda. Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. I think we need I'd to even go for a bit more than an hour, ninety yeah. minutes because what time is it now? We start at six. Right. Seven fifteen. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I mean we can shoot a lot of breeze, but. Yeah still have more to go. Does that work? It, are you thinking then of having a, a meeting that's kind of to talk about the issues you might want to get into more depth in in a retreat? To learn or things that you want more information from us on or, you know, things you'd like us to coordinate with council, just coming up with that basket of ideas? Okay. Mm -hmm. If you want to arrange that amongst yourself, but please be sure to let me know in time that I can get it into the paper. So let's say at least two weeks in advance. Mm -hmm. okay. So I can be sure to do the legal side of it. For scheduling. Yeah. <laughs> I was thinking kind of like the end of September or something, if, mm -hmm. if that works. But yeah, yeah, it's only yeah we got to talk to our absent, absent members tonight, too, and see what they think. Say what? Speak oh, Stephanie. Yeah. 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 End of September works for me. Yeah. August <coughs> is really hard, so. Yeah, that's not good. Do you guys want to come up with a tentative date now? Yes, please. Okay. What about the week of the 17th? How's that look for anyone? Yeah, I'm cool with that. Yeah, that's all I've got going on, too. Of August or September? Uh, September. What do you guys think? I'm good. Yeah. Which date? Do you want to do it on um, on a Tuesday? Or what is it? Monday? I mean, when did... I can do Monday or Tuesday of that week or Friday. The 17th, 18th, <laughs> or the 21st. Yeah, or Tuesday. the 20th. Tuesday's actually the only day I can't do it, and that's the first thing I said, so I apologize on that. 
Any other morning I can do but Tuesday of the week. I'll be oh, Monday? on the 21st. I weekend. can do Monday. Yeah, how about Friday? Monday. Friday. No, you're not. No, he's going to be out of town. I'm going to be out of town on the 21st. You said that. My bad. For the weekend. It's my day. Tomorrow. Oh, yeah, we'll go like Monday, perhaps. Then. I'm going to go somewhere else. Yeah. We're I don't going. know where. <laughs> We're going. Yeah. So we're still on that week. What time are we talking about York. doing? Mornings, evenings? Can we do the 24th? That's a Monday. Are you, are you back by then? I am. Um, are you talking about in the evening? For breakfast? Well, uh, I have patients all day, Monday, Tuesday, Thursdays. And Monday okay. night I have bylaws meeting. Monday, Tuesday, Thursdays? So yeah. Wednesdays and Fridays are good for you? Those are my better days, yes. Okay, so Not how always. about the 26th? No, Wednesday's good. What about you? Okay. Wednesday's fine. Friday's Wednes fine. Wednesday the 26th? Okay, Wednesday the 26th. In the morning? In the morning. Are we like 9 a.m.? Like 6.30. Shut up. <laughs> <laughs> Count me out. We don't have a form anymore. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. you guys are safe. <laughs> okay. Wednesday 26 is what we're looking at. Yes. And the Jesus. last thing I would need to know is where. Yeah. Time? Do we figure what was our time? time? Nine. Nine? Did you say everybody? Yeah. Nine? It'll be lunchtime by then. <laughs> you don't get a say. Nine a.m. Okay, nine. Okay. Where do you want to go? Where do you guys want to go? Well, we, it has to be recorded, right? So. It does, and if again, if you have it in somebody's house, that makes it awkward if somebody from the public kind of just shows up. We I, can do it at my cafe. The pancake if house. You guys want. No, that makes it look gross. I mean, I'm not cooking or anything. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, Wednesday is my office day. I don't do anything down there. But we don't have to. We could go anywhere. Really, all we need is a big table to sit down at, mm -hmm. and it's quiet. Quiet. That's the tough part, though. How about whiskey yeah, exactly. Because they're not going to get that at. Whiskey's not going to be quiet. Mm -mm. In the morning? <laughs> Are they busy in the morning? They're pretty busy, aren't they? At night? I don't know. I don't know. I don't know where is. I don't either. I always go out of town for all this kind of stuff, so. What are you thinking? The I library? think the library's library's quiet. Mine? Yeah. Um, as long as you don't do anything. I won't do anything. Okay. I'll put a reservation in so we have it. But will it be open for breakfast that morning too? Oh yeah, yeah. It'll be open at eight. So it's going to so be much. at Homemade Cafe. Yeah. Which, okay. which place? Homemade Cafe. Okay. Do you know where that is? No. Nope. Right over there. Wow. Right there. Oh. On the hill. Really? I'll no kidding. Five three seven. Some education needs to be happening. Here. <laughs> That's the first thing. Dinner service. We'll talk about where we work and what we do for a living. Yeah, right. exactly. And who our relatives are. So you don't talk about them. <laughs> Purplish color. So funny. I've heard of it. I just haven't been there. That's right. Um, I need okay. So. Thank you. That's Hopefully a good I didn't start. Piss off my staff today. Just now. <laughs> <laughs> Do we need to come pick up like an audio recording device from you guys or anything? Yes. And if there's anything that you want me to research or prepare for you in advance of this, let me know. So I'm happy to do that. Okay. If you can let Stephanie and Trish know too. Yeah. Or, I mean, I'm gonna I'm gonna email them and let them know um, about this, but it's. If there's anything that they have specific concerns about that you know of that haven't been identified here that they want more information on, just have them get in touch with me. Okay. We can also discuss it more on the fourth. Yeah. To clean to get things finalized. Right. And bring a list of if mm -hmm. we come up with any ideas. Are we all on the city email? I, I don't yes. know how to get in. The no, way. I don't use that one. I've either. been emailing everybody at home because I know there have been ongoing issues yeah. with access. She does. I know my city emails get forwarded because I get, you know, potluck down on them, so cafeteria. <laughs> so um, the next thing on the agenda is the approval of the minutes from June 5th and July 12th, but I have two July 12ths and no 5th. Oh, maybe I got two of them on two. Maybe I got yours. I got July 12th. What do you got? I have two 12ths. Okay. Oh, me too. I got the 5th and the 12th, so <laughs> you want to wait my the 12th. I wasn't even here on the 5th, so. And I wasn't here on the 5th. Okay, good. So we'll That's switch. Sweet. We got it. Okay. And Annette, also in the folder for this for the signed minutes, we, we turned out we didn't have a signed copy from March, so that just needs your signature as well. Okay. Please. Actually, I have one right here with the minutes in this folder. 
so let's start with June 5th. So does anybody want to make a motion? Yeah, I was here. I'll make a motion to accept the minutes from June 5th. Okay. I'll second it. Um, all in favor? Aye. 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 All opposed? All right. So let's go on to June 12th. I mean, July 12th, sorry. I make a motion to approve the minutes from the July 12th Planning Commission meeting. Is there a second? Yes. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. All those opposed? And, and we don't have to do the sixth, right? I just have to sign it? Correct. Okay. So, if there isn't anything else, anybody have anything? I don't. Okay, we're adjourned. Thank you. Thank you. I was reading these comments though on the back of this. Did you read? I was just starting. I was just reading them. This is my favorite line. Um, Geek Harbor has also gotten rid of all their transients and loitering. Another good oh, example see you. of the city government <laughs> cleaning up the problems. Press <laughs> me tonight. Yeah, like, All right. I I'm see that a lot of times. That That's I need this something. Thing. She just handed us <laughs> this one. Oh, it's yeah. over here. It's this oh, one. Oh, I'm right here. Yeah, you've I'm got to really get to be your own boss. <laughs> insane. Good. Have a good night. I'm a razor wire. I'm going to figure out where my wife is. <laughs> hey, I like that idea. See you later. See you later. Who's going to be the liability? Uh, have the liability. Uh, Mike Harry. Or my puppy is making you crazy. But I think maybe more attention on. I do too. I'm amazing. Yeah. But you know, 